Oh hi there, welcome to my channel. My name is Leah and today is Tuesday, so that means it's time for Get Ready With Murder. This is a series where I will tell you a gripping true crime tale while I put on a full face of makeup. Today we are telling the story of the disappearance of Bonnie Hain and the very recent um, kind of conclusion of it. So if you want to hear this really gripping tale, make sure to stay tuned. All right, let's just jump right into it. There's a whole lot going on. Today we're going to talk about the disappearance of Bonnie Haim. Um, I'll just show you what I'm using. I'm not going to talk about it at all, um, but I will list everything down in the description box below. So check that out if you want to know what products I'm using. In 1992, Bonnie Haim, who was married to Michael Haim, um, they had a three-year-old son named Aaron. They lived in Jacksonville, Florida, and like from the outside seemed like they had a pretty great life, which seems to be a recurring theme in most of these stories. Bonnie and Michael both worked for Michael's aunt Eve Ann at her and her husband's construction supply company. Um, so they were always, you know, kind of close all the time, always together. Um, his aunt would say that they had a pretty volatile relationship in that Michael had a pretty bad temper. And him having that bad temper led to him becoming abusive towards Bonnie. Um, to the point where one time Eve Ann said that they were fighting in the parking lot and she saw him slam Bonnie's hand in their car door and just like, you know, it broke all the fingers and bruised all her bones. So that was a pretty public display of, yeah, I have no problem being physically violent towards you in front of my family and our coworkers. So with that and probably quite a few other things at home, um, Bonnie decided eventually that she was going to leave Michael. So what she did was set up some bank accounts in her own name and hid them, like squirreled away money, had the account, um, had the statements go to her, um, under a different name at the office and was getting ready to take Aaron and just leave. Eventually, after less than a year of this, Michael found out about the accounts and like was super enraged. Bonnie ended up closing the accounts, but she never changed her plans to save money and leave Michael. So what she did instead, because she's a smarty pants, was still save up the money, but give it to a good friend of hers to hold. Um, and then um, basically saved up enough money to get a down payment on a new apartment, enrolled Aaron in a new preschool and was ready to go. And then on the night of January 6, 1993, um, right when Bonnie was getting ready to go and like leave, she was supposed to be helping Eve Ann um, with a friend's baby shower. So she was supposed to go home from work, get her stuff, and then meet up with Eve Ann to play on the baby shower. And what ended up happening is she called Eve Ann and you know said, Michael and I got into a discussion He's pretty upset and she was crying and you know, just really upset about this. And Evan said, you know, should I call you later? And she said, no, no, I'll be fine. We're gonna have this discussion. I'll see you in the morning. And then in the morning, neither of them showed up for work. Um, eventually Michael did show up and state that Bonnie was missing. So they called the police and they started an investigation. Um, they basically were looking for her as a missing person until a little bit later that day, they found her car. And when I say they found her car, I meant they found her purse. They found her purse first and they'll find her car a little bit later. Um, so initially they were thinking that maybe robbery was the reason um, for Bonnie's disappearance. Maybe she was robbed and, you know, killed for her money. But her purse was found basically intact. Nothing was missing. There was actual money in there. There was credit cards in there. Um, everything was in her purse. It was just dumped in a dumpster by a motel about five miles away. At this point, Michael's story was that he and Bonnie had had an argument the evening before. Um, she left at about 11 p.m., drove off by herself, um, and then Michael called his mom to come over and keep an eye on Aaron um, while he went to go look for Bonnie. So I guess he was out and looked for her for about 45 minutes um, and then came home and basically like went to bed and um, called in sick for work the next morning. He didn't call the police at this point. Um, he just like came home after about 45 minutes of looking. So while he gave them this story, the, the detectives were not exactly convinced um, that this was true. So one of the detectives was, you know, thinking that, hey, we found her purse in a dumpster at this motel. It's an airport motel. I wonder if her car is at the airport. And sure enough, there it was like in long-term parking. And when the police got there to process the vehicle, 
um, which is a term I know now from watching crime documentaries and serving on a jury, they were processing the vehicle and they noticed that the driver's seat was like too far back because Bonnie wasn't that tall, but Michael was tall. So the driver's seat would have been in the position for him to be driving and not her. And they found a boot print in the car that was, he, they said it was a pristine print and they traced that back to one of Michael's shoes. And the police officer said that that footprint could only have been left by the last person to drive that car. But at this point, of course, it's not enough evidence. And even Bonnie's father didn't believe it. He said things like, you know, my wife has a car and my footprint is in my wife's car. That doesn't mean anything, you know, it's a car that we both drive. So her dad was definitely on Michael's side. He was, you know, stating Bonnie just left. She was planning to leave and she finally just left. Um, but the plan was never to leave without Aaron. And Aaron was actually home that night. So the police decided to have a child psychologist talk to him. Um, and in the conversation with the child psychologist, they basically determined that per Aaron's testimony and what the he said to the psychologist, Michael had, there had been a big fight. Michael had basically killed Bonnie and driven off with her body. And this was, you know, all something that a three-year-old basically was witness to. Um, I have a three-year-old and he doesn't really make up huge stories like that. They base their stories that they tell in things that they've actually seen in real life. So for a three-year-old to make something up like that is kind of impossible. Even after this, Bonnie's father still didn't believe that Michael had killed her. Um, he still was on Michael's side saying that Bonnie just left. Um, you can't be, basically you can't trust what a three-year-old says. He was just making stuff up. So at this point, nobody has been or had been discovered um, and without really any evidence besides her car, a ditched purse, and the testimony of a three-year-old, they didn't really have anything to go on to pursue any charges really against Michael. So um, she was still considered a missing person, but her you know, parents and Michael still say that she just left, that they believe she's alive out there somewhere, and um, she just left the marriage. However, throughout all of this, Michael actually lost custody in parental rights to Aaron because per the judge, he was at risk of abuse because he was the only living witness to the murder of his mother. So Aaron was adopted and later after Bonnie was declared legally dead, Aaron and his adoptive parents sued Michael uh, stating that he was responsible for Bonnie's murder. So in 2005, Aaron was awarded 25, no, $26.3 million um, because of the loss of his mother and also ongoing mental trauma. He apparently still recalls seeing that his, in his words, daddy shot mommy in the stomach. Um, and his story has not changed to this day. He recalls seeing it. And as part of the settlement, he actually got his childhood home. Um, so he was given the home that he and his mother and father lived in and where he um, says that he witnessed his father killing his mother. So as an adult, he you know had had ownership of this home and the home was probably a little bit outdated. He decided to do some renovations to the home. And that brings us to 2014. So Aaron had the home, he decided he was gonna do some renovations. And when you do some renovations and remodeling to homes, you know, you gotta get down in the dirt and start digging around. Maybe you're gonna expand your garage. Maybe you're gonna tear down some area. Um, so while this was happening, they, during digging, they actually found a piece of a human skull, called the police, um, did some excavating and found a little bit some other remains in the area um, and then in 2015 we're finally able to get DNA testing done on it um, and DNA testing proved that that was the body of Bonnie Haim. So not only did Aaron witness the murder of his mother by their father, he was also the one who ended up finding her body 20 years later in his own home. After that, Michael was arrested and maintained his not guilty status. Um, but once the trial started, there was plenty 
of witnesses testifying not on his behalf that's for sure um, they had Aaron testifying everything that he still remembered um, family members came forward and testified and even two people that he was in prison with came forward as like informants stating that they two people they had each individually heard him confessing to Bonnie's murder that he killed her and he buried her at their home his trial actually started on April 9th and today is the what 23rd they're already done um so the trial was set forth you basically heard the whole story with all of the witness testimony um the jury found him guilty of second degree murder and he will be sentenced in about two to three weeks on the 17th of may um at this point he faces between uh, what five eight and life in prison so we'll see how it goes when sentencing comes around this will be another one, of course, I'll keep you guys updated. On these, when I say there's going to be updates, always check the pinned comments. Whew, this is a nice highlighter because that's where I'm going to put them. Um, it just makes it easier and kind of bumps everything to the top so you guys can see what the actual status of the case is. So I'm going to set myself a calendar reminder to see what Mr. I killed my wife and buried her in my backyard, Michael Haim, gets. And that is the story of the disappearance and murder of Bonnie Haim by her husband, Michael. Let me know in the comments below what you guys thought of this. I thought it was super interesting, very sad. It is so sad for that poor little boy and all of his life remembering seeing his mom killed by his father. Like, it's just clearly imprinted in his brain. He can't get rid of it. Like, he wrote essays in eighth grade detailing it and how he remembers seeing his dad shoot his mom in the stomach and his grandparents actually helping hide the body. So, um, at least he's going to get some justice and the rest of her family will too. Like, he's known all along, but now he knows that everyone is going to know that his dad is actually guilty. Um, and hopefully maybe it'll give him some closure and be able to move on and have um, at least a somewhat happy life. If that is it for me. If you like this video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button. It really helps my channel. There are new Get Ready With Murders every single Tuesday. And if you guys have any requests, definitely let me know in the comments. I want to know what stories you want to hear. Um, all right. Have a super great rest of your day and we'll see you in the next video. Bye, 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 bye.